exactly the same. Right. Good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the Amsterdam Center for European Studies, I welcome you to this final concluding session of the lecture series Common European Asylum System. Where are you headed for? Covid is. And um, it is my great honor to welcome Professor Sandra Levinex from the University of Geneva, who came all the way by train, I believe, um, which is a magnificent trip, I think. It's a night train. Oh, you do a night train. Yeah. So you have your eyes closed. You don't see the view. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so you can cut it. <laughs> um, but we've had four lectures in which we've explored, you know, what, what we know and what we can know, can learn about the common European asylum system. And of course, the question is, why isn't it delivering what it's delivered, what it ought to deliver? And partly, it can deliver, but for this, we need organized hypocrisy and, and, and the idea of, of falling forward, stumbling forward, and, and usually things in Europe, when they really evolve, they result from a sense of crisis. Uh, the euro crisis for instance is a good example and the question is is there enough crisis in the asylum field to actually make things really happen and with that question in the room i hope you can play with <laughs> and if not do something completely different but you <laughs> thank, prepare. thank thanks you thanks a lot uh, yes so thanks a lot for the invitation it's a pleasure to be here and thanks for coming um you may, some of you may be aware that I, I wrote this piece on, on uh, failing forward in EU refugee policy, uh, but for failing forward in what direction? And then I introduced the, the notion of organized hypocrisy. This is a couple of years ago. Um, actually, I was invited in Amsterdam first in 2016 to give a talk on the, what it was called the refugee crisis, and I called the crisis of the common European asylum system. It was also by UASIS, I think, uh, by, by ACES. Um, and this was the first talk I gave on this. And then uh, in Trento, at the, um, I gave, I gave the JCMS uh, uh, annual lecture on the topic um, in 2016. And by then I was very much taken by what was happening. It was, I mean, it was really a sense of, you know, many things going very bad. and. Uh, and I found this notion of organized hypocrisy very helpful to take some distance, um, yeah, develop an analytical uh, perspective on, on some contradictions and, and, and failures um, and put them into a more general um, outlook uh, of how organizations function. And now I was uh, yeah, delighted to, to get this invitation but how many years later, six years later, <laughs> and uh, I, I, I'm afraid my analysis is still quite similar, but, 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 um, but there are some new elements that have come in, uh, and well, this is where, where I will take you. So let's start, I will share my screen. Um... Yes, so let's start with what you all know. This is not working, it doesn't matter. So this is not working either. <laughs> like this, no? Yes, um, you all know on paper, the EU has quite a nice asylum system. Um, mm -hmm. There are rules on the entry to the territory. Then there are the rules on the allocation of responsibility based on Dublin and the Eurodac uh, system. Then we have common rules on reception, on the asylum procedure, on the asylum status. And either you make it or you don't. And if you don't, there's a return directive. Um, OK, we know on, on paper it's not working. But in the ambition, it's still there, this common European asylum system. I think this is, this is important to note. Then Frontex. Um, Frontex also on paper has quite um, developed rules, and these are guidelines released in 2016. Um, and also here you will see it's all in line with international law. Um, everyone is entitled to protection and uh, uh, against refoulement, protection against refoulement, uh, has a right to posit an asylum claim, and nobody shall be punished because of irregular entry. Um, this is the, the protection of the pro protective key of the European Union that is still there in the ambition and on paper. 
But we also have an Aki that is very much on protectionism. The most visible um, aspect of this is yeah, maybe you change. Yeah. <laughs> the most visible, tangible aspect of this are the fences that have proliferated around Europe. Um, the outcry was pretty strong when Viktor Orban introduced his uh, fence um, to, to the south in 2015-16. More recently, uh, Poland-Belarus border. Uh, but what is little known is that the first fence, physical fence, um, at the EU external border was introduced in 2011 at the uh, uh, land border between Greece and Turkey, um, and it was sponsored by EU funds in 2011. <laughs> so this um, has a longer history. And these uh, physical borders, um, are the most visible ones. Of course, we have then Frontex um, in the seas <coughs> and at the borders and, and uh, its practices. But we also have paper borders in, in the Aki, uh, the requirement of a visa, um, the, the carrier sanctions, the liaison officers, and, and all of this. Now, something has happened. Um, we, we have again a war in Europe and we have again refu European refugees um, and here uh, we I think it's worthwhile thinking whether this will bring about a fundamental change uh, in the common European asylum system a change of paradigm um, and this caricature um, tells us two things on the one hand it tells us yes the border is opening up um, and the protective aki is being mobilized. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the caricature also shows us that it's not opening up for everybody. So the contradictions uh, prevail. And, and uh, the question is, what will be the implications of these more recent developments for the common European asylum system? Um, so summing up, um, there are very strong tensions and contradictions in this European asylum policy. Um, how can we make sense of these? Uh, and can they be overcome? And I will uh, take you through this uh, in three steps. First, uh, provide my diagnosis with this notion of organized hypocrisy that I find helpful uh, conceptually uh, because it, it explains us uh, how organizations get into such situations. Um, and then, uh, it, so it helps us to understand, yes, to understand what's going on, but then I would also like to explain a bit what's going on, and here I will uh, draw three explanations, the two first uh, on the list, path dependencies and conflicts of interest are, I think, uh, well covered in the literature by now, but I think the third one, the conflict of norms, has not yet been really um, discussed so much, and maybe this is... Uh, because uh, empirical political science research is maybe a bit um, blind on, 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 on these more normative uh, and philosophical questions, uh, but I think it has to be brought in uh, more strongly. As in the third step, then I will look at uh, potential uh, developments. Do, can, is there a perspective to move towards more consistency, to overcome organized hypocrisy, or will we see more uh, of the same, more muddling through and maintenance of organized hypocrisy, or will we see something completely different? Um, so let's start with the organized hypocrisy. This is so the, the diagnosis that we can uh, apply here. Um, and this notion comes from, organize, from organizational um, sociology and uh, it describes uh, reactions by organizations in situations where these organizations find um, intractable conflicts or conflicting demands from their environments that they cannot reconciliate. Um, it is a decoupling of talk and action, a decoupling of what the organization pretends to be doing, uh, what it aspires to be doing, but also what it puts into its laws and texts and discourses on the one hand, and on the other hand, uh, its actions, its deeds, what it is actually producing and, and carrying out 
on the ground. Um, I, I, yeah, this describes quite well what I showed you in the beginning, the Akion paper and what is happening on the ground at, at the EU borders and um, territories. Um, so in short, the, the term uh, organized hypocrisy sounds, sounds pejorative, right? Um, this notion of hypocrisy, but in organizational sociology, it's, it's very much a coping strategy that organizations have because they cannot satisfy uh, their environment. Um, they decouple, uh, they, they try to do both at the same time. They try to uh, serve normative demands and, and aspirations and to serve uh, political interests and strategic priorities, um, even though uh, both are uh, in opposition to each other. And here I just brought you two illustrations of, of these um, two environments that the EU faces. So in organization sociology, they say that all organizations have a normative environment. These are the uh, rules of um, appropriate behavior, uh, the, the values, um, we could say in our case, these are the values of, um, yes, of the liberal international order or, or of the world society, if, if you want to bring in uh, more organizational sociology. Um, it's human rights, it's liberalism, it's universalism, it's rule of law. Um, and of course, the EU is very much into this normative environment. It, it has built up an identity as a normative power um, that is not only an academic construct, but if you look at how the EU represents and sees itself in the world, then you see it's, it's really attached to this um, fun foundation of itself uh, as a normative power, uh, including the rule of law <laughs> in, uh, in more procedural terms, and of course, substantive terms for the individual rights. But the strategic environment, this is um, the constitutive um, part uh, of, of the organization. Uh, who are the members? What do they demand from the organization? Here we are in the world of the member states and, and their interests, their priorities. What do they want to use the EU for? Um, and and the, these are very different um, than uh, preferences. Um, I, I have just taken a book on neuroscepticism that has been published recently to illustrate um, these counter movement uh, uh, in the strategic environment of the EU, which indeed demand uh, uh, very different answers from the normative environment. And in, in this, this sense, the organized hypocrisy is, is a coping, it's a survival strategy to try to continue to live up to the normative ambition while at the same time maintaining the support from the constituency. Now, how did we get there? Uh, why, why do we stand here? Um, institutional path dependence, I think, um, explains quite a bit. Um, when you look at how cooperation on asylum has developed, then you will see that the protectionist element was there from the start not so much the protective um, element. It, it was framed as compensatory measures for the safeguarding of internal security after the abolition of internal border controls. <laughs> and I say this by heart because this is what you find in the texts, what you find in the Dublin uh, Convention, what you find in the Schengen Agreements, what you find then in the Maastricht Treaty, and which you still find today in the treaty. It's uh, cooperation for the safeguarding of internal security of the abolition of internal border controls or later after, well, for the area of freedom, security and justice. And now we would say for protecting our way of life, right? <laughs> um, um, in the literature, we have mobilized this notion of intergovernmental venue shopping, uh, especially by the interior ministries uh, who have used also this context in the EU to, um, to push for, for restrictive reforms uh, domestically uh, and have uh, focused on the fight against abusive asylum claims in a porous Europe after the uh, abolition of internal border controls. Um, so in, in my dissertation, uh, I, I analyzed how German and French uh, asylum uh, reforms were linked to the cooperation at the EU level in Schengen and, and uh, what became the Dublin Convention uh, with this rule that one member state would be responsible for examining an asylum claim. Um, it, it, the, in Germany and France, they had to change the constitution in order to 
uh, to introduce this uh, Dublin system because under the constitution they had to examine each asylum claim uh, on its own grounds and could not just shift the responsibility to another member state. And, but, but the goal to reform the constitution in Germany was dated back quite a while, uh, especially in the conservative parties. And uh, there was really this two level game that permitted them to reform the constitution. So this is this notion of venue shopping. Uh, so, so this protectionist part of the Aki um, was there at the start. The protective Aki, uh, what uh, you know, the um, directives on asylum procedures, on status determination, on the reception conditions, this came later. Um, and it was promoted by the European Commission, um, especially then after the Amsterdam Treaty. Um, not only because of the normative ambition of the Commission, but also because it was seen as necessary to make the system of mutual recognition under Dublin work. So some minimum standards, some equality of standards in the member states was required to apply Dublin. Um, this is the start of this normative ambition. But the strategic environment was still very active and continued to pursue um, uh, the protectionist agenda, what we see in this period where um, no more normative element priorities come in the internal dimension of harmonization, we see a stronger uh, evolution of the external dimension uh, of EU asylum and migration policies. And here, um, uh, a venue shifting uh, by, by member states to try to externalize um, elements of, of their asylum policy. Um, the normative ambition is maintained uh, in, in the third phase after the Lisbon Treaty. It is widened, it, is, it becomes more supranational from the procedures, but also from the uh, ambition. We have the charter, we have a recast uh, of, of the directives. Um, we have the ambition of a common procedure, a common status, we have the principle of solidarity, uh, and of course, a court which comes in. This is also an important element of stronger legalization of all of this and uh, yeah, potential pressure uh, for conformity on the member states. Um, the protectionist uh, priorities were still very active, the external dimension um, developed uh, dynamically, uh, readmission agreements in the competence of the EU and, and all sorts of other uh, cooperation elements. So we have this parallelism. But I would say now we are in a fourth phase after the crisis and uh, we are still there. We are on the internal dimension, this, this, this protective internal Aki is not a stalemate. Um, we have a series of reform proposals, none of them has come uh, to, to bear since 2016. But uh, on the protectionist side, we, we're still uh, uh, very active uh, with new instruments and uh, mainstreaming on, uh, of migration policy goals, of migration control goals in all EU external uh, policies, in foreign policy, but also foreign yeah, development policy. Um, security policy, um, more conditionality coming in again, and, and so on. So um, yeah, I think another way to, to dis describe this institutional past dependence, I just take this slide that I, I had from before, is, um, is, is this one where you see a bit in a different way, the, the evolution uh, linked to the mode of, of cooperation, of integration. We have a lot happening outside the EU framework, purely intergovernmental. Then we have a phase of intergovernmentalism within the EU with the first protective um, normative ambitions coming in the transition period that was still from the decision making procedures quite intergovernmental. Um, then we have uh, the this, this phase um, with supranational procedures. Um, but then the stalemate, and uh, uh, actually we can say already after 2013, we have had no, no major reforms here, um, and more dynamics on the protectionist side. So this past dependence is, is the first 
um, explanation for where we stand today. But of course, um, it has the, the stalemate has its roots in conflicts between the member states and the first kind of conflicts are conflicts of interest. Um, this is well known. Uh, I think I don't have to go into details that member states face different situations. Some are more under pressure, some are less under pressure, but I think it's quite useful and, and, and eye-opening to look at, at some statistics. And these ones are from the European Asylum Support Agency. You know, they also, as it used to be called, uh, for 2020. Um, and they show, show the diversity of situations that the member states or EU plus states with the associated ones face. Um, the first one here shows the asylum, number, asylum seeker numbers in 2020 uh, in, in three metrics uh, by, um, measured by uh, GDP, um, by population size of so per capita, and uh, by country size, but territory. Um, the, yeah, you see some metrics coming into which we will come later again. But um, if, if you apply these metrics, uh, you see that only three countries are actually above the EU baseline. So there is a notion of what a fair share would be, which is in white. Um, and everything that is above the fair share is red. And what is below is blue. And basically, three countries are above this uh, EU baseline. 14 countries are below, and the rest is somewhat within that margin. So, this tells us the status quo is not so bad. I mean, okay, this is 2020, it's, it's a snapshot, but broadly, the picture is stable. Uh, and the other graph I took um, to show not only the diversity in terms of how countries are affected by the phenomenon, but also uh, with regard to domestic asylum systems, the diversity of domestic asylum systems. In theory, we should not have this variation here. It is about recognition rates uh, for uh, asylum seekers from um, the 10 national entities from which uh, went which from which, which are most recognized as refugees. Um, and each dot shows you um, the recognition rate by one member state, um, only uh, for uh, member states that have more than 300 first instance decisions in that year. Uh, the bigger the dot, the more um, decisions they have had. Uh, but uh, what is more important is the axis here, the vertical axis is the recognition rate. So in theory, we have the uh, status directive, which defines the criteria for recognizing somebody <laughs> as a refugee since 2004. Now this statistic is from 2020, 16 years later, and we still see a very large diversity between the member states for Afghanistan, it reaches from 0% in one member state to 100% in another member state. Um, also, if you look at Syria, um, also here, the recognition rates are below 40 in one member state and around 100 in another. Uh, Turkey, also very large variation. And this should not be the case if we had harmonization. We would see, it does not mean one-to-one, -one, but it would mean that from the same nationalities, we would see more similar recognition rates across Europe. So member states' asylum systems still remain very diverse, although we have these um, attempts at harmonization. But I think these conflicts of interest, yes, they explain a certain stalemate but, but it's not the whole story because you could think that conflicts of interest, you can overcome them with some package deals, with some issue linkages also. So the normative questions, the uh, uh, conflicts of norms are more fundamental and, and these are not so easy to treat. Um, and here, I would like to talk a little bit about the asylum norm and, and then uh, Ray uh, would be nice to discuss with you uh, as well. Um, it, it's in the nature of asylum, that of, of the norm of asylum, that these two issues between state sovereignty and human 
rights universalism or at least the universalist claim of human rights are not easily recognized. So there is a fundamental normative tension within the institution of asylum because um, under a, a refugee law, it is the prerogative of the state to grant asylum. It is not the right of the individual to be granted asylum. The Geneva Convention has consciously um, defined uh, the norm of asylum as a prerogative of the state to grant asylum and not as an entitlement of the individual to be granted asylum. This is different in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, so three years before the Geneva Convention, uh, the non-binding universal declaration says that everybody has the right to ask and be granted asylum. Uh, but in the Geneva Convention, they didn't go this road. It's, 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 it's more state-centric, more sovereignty-centric. Um, so uh, it's not a human right as such, the asylum. But uh, in the Geneva Convention, we have in uh, Article 33, the norm of non-refoulement. And the norm of non-refoulement has de facto been interpreted as um, bringing an obligation on the state to admit a person on the territory uh, to grant access to the asylum procedure. De facto, it has been uh, interpreted this way and it has been interpreted in a strong manner. It has become, well, if you read uh, legal um, texts, uh, some say it's a use Kogan's norm. I don't know, maybe it has changed. I have not seen recent legal um, arguments about this, but it used to be uh, defined as the use Kogan's uh, uh, norm and um, and it has been also uh, introduced in, in numerous other uh, international uh, treaties, um, the anti-torture convention, the convention against disappearance um, and regional human rights instruments. So it's a very strong norm, this non full norm. And this one is here. This one is very clearly on the side of human rights universalism. So within the Geneva Convention, within uh, refugee law, we have this tension between the prerogatives of the state and the right of the individual. Um, now, I, I argue that in the European context, uh, so at the national level, states have to find out their own way between these two prerogatives. But within the context of European integration, the conflict of norms is exacerbated because we have a vertical pressure on state sovereignty that is added uh, by the idea of integration and of uh, EU competence that is being developed that of course demands <laughs> concessions on the side of state sovereignty. So um, this constellation um, on top uh, of, of the tensions within the institution of asylum and in the context where the European Union wants to be a normative power uh, and is a supranational organization. Um, th this really exacerbates uh, the, the normative conflicts and it leads to adverse effects in the sense that member states who feel under pressure, uh, they um, take distance from the sense of responsibility that they might have towards the international refugee regime. And it becomes also easy to blame the others, to blame the EU, to blame Frontex, or to blame other member states when something is, is not functioning well. Um, and, and this um, dilutes um, the, uh, each state's yeah, uh, uh, commitment to the international refugee regime. Uh, and and this, this normative constellation is not easy to, to solve. Yeah? It's not easy to solve. <laughs> Uh, and I would say this is the fundamental problem. So from here, I would uh, now uh, try to look ahead. Uh, can, can we overcome the organized hypocrisy? Uh, will we move towards, is it possible to move towards more consistency or rather muddling through maintenance of uh, the status quo of organized hypocrisy? Or can we see maybe uh, some other kind of change coming up. Um, uh, the key challenges in this context are to reestablish state responsibility in the context of European solidarity and reconcile the protectionist and the protective agenda. So uh, Brunson and, and the notion of organized hypocrisy um, contains some suggestions how, how 
hypocrisy can be overcome. And, and basically he says, you need either a change on the side of the strategic environment of the organization that brings um, the priorities of the strategic environment closer to the ambition of the normative environment. So here we would see interests moving closer to the norms, or uh, we have a change in the normative environment. So the normative aspiration is brought closer to the political priorities. And this basically means the ambition is diminished to, to come more in line with the political interests. Um, for the first constellation, change in the strategic environment um, to bring the protectionist agenda closer to the protective one, uh, there are two, two scenarios that I think we can uh, put aside uh, in, in the literature. One is low perceived stakes. So if the problem uh, is not so salient anymore, it's not so challenging anymore, I think this we can forget because uh, refugee numbers, uh, forced, forced displacement is, is likely to ra rather increase rather than decrease. Um, the other uh, unlikely scenario is authoritative rule. So he says, well, when there, when there is an authority that can come in and force uh, the organization to behave consistently. Um, I think this is an interesting notion. I mean, the EU is not supranational enough to force member states to do something. We have seen uh, Hungary has also decided not to follow the court of justice. It, 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 it's not strong enough. Hegemony would be another concept of authority, and, and Germany has perhaps tried a little bit uh, in 2016 when it opened uh, the borders to, to Syrian refugees, and it hoped that other member states would follow. Um, it, it, it tried to exert hegemony to lead by example, but it failed, so we don't have a hegemony who can help out. So we can rule out this possibility. Then, uh, is there still some room for compromise? Uh, Branson would say maybe you have to look closely whether there's some room for compromise. So I will check a bit more this um, possibility in the strategic environment, and then um, also uh, reflect on changes in the innovative environment that might happen and uh, bring the protective agenda closer to the protectionist one. So let's look at compromise. And, and I, I love this formula because I think when you go through the text of the European Commission, it's so technocratic. If you look at the, the latest one, this Pact for Migration and Asylum of 2020, the, it, the, you have beautiful brochures with, with now more and more pictograms and, and, and things. But it's so, it's, it's the attempt by nitty gritty calculations and to, 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 to reach consensus. And, and this is the formula that was proposed for the relocations in 2016 that famously failed, but, but, but it's still maintained, it's still there, even if it's not officially embraced, uh, it, it is a fight. Uh, so it's population size, it's GDP, it's asylum, uh, number of asylum seekers, unemployment, uh, and then some calculations of this. But, but what, what I want to say is this, this is the, the way that the Commission tries to deal with conflicts of interests. Uh, and and if you look back at, at uh, ah no yes and, and now I tell you why this does not work well we, we know that it does not work but but we uh, saw this very well uh, this is a, a, a calculation of uh, member states um, uh, effectiveness or numbers of asylum seekers if we had applied this formula. And uh, this color here is the um, excess or um, excess if it goes uh, above zero, or I don't know what the opposite of excess is, but uh, what, what they have less than if we applied the formula. Uh, and um, you see that five countries in 2000. Um, 16, this one, not 2015, five countries in 2015, if we had applied the formula, were clearly in excess, or at least well, Hungary and, and, and Germany were in excess, and, and Hungary most of all, but Hungary is also the one who 
most forcefully rejected uh, this system of relocation. So it's not, you know, conflicts of, in, it's not only conflicts of interest, otherwise you would have got a country like Hungary. And, and you also see that so many uh, were below actually um, the calculated reception capacity. Um, so they benefit from the status quo again. Uh, we won't get there by, by, by these technocratic calculation, yet the EU still applies them. And here I take again this, this slide that I showed before, because it's not usual that, you know, you show asylum seeker statistics broken down by GDP per capita, by population size or by country size. It, it, it's not the way normally we just had the, the numbers and perhaps per capita, yeah, we had the distinction absolute numbers versus per capita, but the EU continues to show by GDP, um, by, by territory, uh, and perhaps, you know, in another graph we will see also by unemployment rates, also some of the other elements we had in the formula. So, uh, but, but, but the more important um, suggestion that I want to make is that this does not do the trick. We don't get at the consensus uh, by, by these reforms, yet they make, uh, they are the, the biggest part of the proposals by the commission. The biggest part of the proposals of the commission are of this kind, nitty gritty calculations uh, for, for um, how to come to solidarity. Now let's have a, a bit a look at this new pact on asylum and migration. There's a lot, uh, of more protectionism in there. Um, we have a new border procedure, screening procedure, um, empowerment of fr Frontex, more conditionality in external relations for readmission. And we have a very important part that is derogation from the protective acquis uh, uh, in, in several regards. For example, uh, the, new, the new proposal for uh, procedures direct or regulation, it should become a regulation. This is older than the pact, uh, the proposal, um, waters down the criteria for recognizing a country as safe third country. So we have a derogation of former EU standards, uh, but also we have a so-called instrumentalization regulation that I will show to you in a minute that provides for many derogations of, of this protective acquis. So it, waters down uh, protective elements that we find in the asylum procedures directive, in the reception conditions directive, and uh, also in the returns directive for situation yeah, of instrumentalization that I will comment on uh, maybe um, yeah, in a minute. Um, so we have more protectionism in the pact, um, but if we want to overcome, overcome hypocrisy, we are particularly interested uh, here um, in elements that bring the protectionist actually closer to the protective uh, aspiration. So um, all which has to do with fair shares, with, with solidarity. And what does the pact bring in here? I think the most, um, the most innovative uh, part uh, of um, the commission proposals to improve state responsibility is this notion of flexible solidarity that has been introduced. So it's no longer mandatory quotas uh, or something like that. It's a more flexible type of solidarity. And um, so states shall have the choice between two um, answers but in, in, in situations of strong influx either help uh, frontline member states through relocation, but this would be voluntary, or uh, participate in so-called return sponsorships. And these return sponsorships, this is the, the new element here. Um, can, they, can, can they bring about more solidarity? So you have to imagine um, it, it works like this. A refugee from an African country comes to Sicily uh, and, um, well, let's say not a, a refugee, let's say a, a, an asylum seeker or a migrant. And in the border procedure, it is found that the person has to be returned, has no right to asylum. Then um, the person uh, cannot immediately um, be returned, but another member state who has not participated in relocation 
can step in and um, support Italy or Sicily in returning the migrant to the country of origin. And this can be done by negotiating on readmission, by offering the country of origin something in, in exchange, whatever diplomatic tools a member state can bring in to help with this return. But the commission knows that it's difficult. We, it's difficult to return irregular migrants um, if, if the country of origin doesn't want to. And we have many cases where it fails. So in this proposal, there is this notion that if it is impossible to return the person within eight months, then the responsibility for the person shifts from the frontline country, from Italy, to the sponsor country who wanted to help out instead of taking in asylum seekers under relocation. And so does, it, does this make the trick? No, it does not, because the sovereignist member states, those who don't want to participate in relocation, they say, well, this is mandatory relocation through the back door. You know, you, you offer us this alternative of, uh, of return sponsorship instead of, of um, participating in relocation. But if, if it fails, we nevertheless have to take this person on our territory, under our jurisdiction. So no, they don't want it. And those who demand uh, more solidarity, the frontline countries, they find it insufficient. They don't think, yeah, they don't, they don't find that this helps them, especially because we have also the border procedures, the screening procedure, everything, which puts in more stress uh, on, on, on the external border. So under these proposals that just focus on the uh, protectionist um, elements and on conflicts of interest, on how to overcome conflicts of interest, um, there won't be uh, an overcoming of organized hypocrisy that will be just more muddling through. And I don't think that many of these proposals will be actually adopted. Um, so um, the second solution that, that is possible is not to change um, the strategic environment, but to change the normative environment in a way that the protective aki is brought closer to the protectionist priorities. And I think there are some observations that go into this direction that our idea of how an asylum policy should be, of, of what the refugee regime would be, are changing in Europe. Um, so we see in the Aki an increasing tendency towards informality, flexibility, and voluntarism. Um, yes, this is, this is a tendency that we find across uh, several parts of the Aki and also in the pact. And we also have a tendency to legalize breaches of international and European law, and in particular um, of, of the non-refoulement norm, but also um, of um, established standards of, to, for example, what constitutes a safe third country under the Asylum Procedures Directive and, um, yes, and other standards that are being watered down slowly. So when I say we have a tendency to, yeah, to, to, to legalize breaches. So the Council of Europe has um, made several judgments in which it says that the hotspots uh, and the camps that have been established are against uh, fundamental human rights. Oh, I think I just... um, it has also issued um, resolutions according to which Turkey is not a safe third country and that the Turkey deal would not be in line with human rights. The EU court has not, you know, has not, uh, has said it has no jurisprudence on the Turkey deal because it's apparently not an EU deal, it's an intergovernmental feature. Um, in, under Spanish law also we have had in 2015 um, court ruling, no, a, a new law, a new law uh, that has been introduced to legalize pushbacks um, at the um, Spanish esclaves in uh, Ceuta and Melilla. Um, in 2020, Van der Leyen uh, has spoken in Greece saying that the pushbacks were uh, in the interest of Europe. Um, 
Yes, and then we have also a, a new a, a proposal for a regulation, this instrumentalization directive that foresees derogations from the standards that we have under the asylum procedures directive, the um, receptions, conditions directive, and, and uh, also the returns directive um, in cases where a third country instrumentalizes refugees to or migrants to destabilize a member state. Um, so we have different um, uh, elements of this tendency to, to legalize uh, a downscaling of legal standards. Um, we also have the phenomenon of externalization that I find fascinating uh, and the new primacy of geopolitics that change the balance between norms and um, political interests. And for the externalization, I'm afraid I'm talking maybe already a bit long. I don't have a <laughs> clock here. Fine, fine. Yeah, yeah, but ah, yeah, now here I see the time. Yes, so very quickly, and I can talk more about it. But externalization means um, a, a weakening of a state's commitment towards refugees, both in terms of the exercise of sovereignty uh, of the state and um, its commitment to human rights and the level of human rights uh, accorded to uh, the person. So it, it, externalization offers quite an attractive way out uh, of uh, the normative tensions because, uh, well, it, it started with the unilateral policies of non admission, visa, safe third country, world borders control. Um, then we went over to cooperative non-arrival policies where EU member states uh, and then also the EU as such entering in as an actor, cooperating with third countries on readmission, imposing liaison officers in um, imposing uh, area sanctions. Then uh, we have a shift even further into the territory of the third country and away from uh, the individuals access to the asylum system by delegated non-arrival policies here the um, the authority over the person is no longer exercised by an eu member state but by the third country uh, so it comes to the sovereignty of the third country um, and the support for that third country is through training through financing through you know um, financing the boats in the Mediterranean and the Libyan forces who will then deter the migrants. Um, and then we have a, 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 an even stronger form of externalization, which uh, we could call outsourced non-departure. And these are policies that really try to prevent uh, the person to leave in the first place. And um, this is this, um, approach to counter the root causes, which, which is well, well meant. Um, but there are also the compacts that are being signed with uh, countries directly in the region of origin, uh, Lebanon, Jordan, um, of, for Syria, uh, which try to keep the people there. Um, and there's also this notion of inland flight alternative that you know, is not yet in EU law, but it's, it's popping up in national uh, legislation which uh, says that there are safe zones within Syria, for example, that uh, prevent uh, yeah, the state from being obliged to admit an asylum seeker. And as there's also this notion of self refugee self-reliance. And each of these steps is accompanied, ah, no, and the last one, of course, in here is this um, extraterritorial processing that has been introduced in England and um, Denmark is trying to. And each of these steps is uh, actually accompanied by some legal um, constraints. Uh, so the, the law tries to, 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 to um, impose limits here. Mm -hmm. So the first one, uh, the German Constitutional Court on the Safe Start Country Rule, which said, well, you have to make sure that there's really an asylum system in Poland, it was at the time, if you want to return a person to Poland. And this motivated then cooperation uh, with Poland to make sure it had an asylum system. Then um, the hearsay judgment by the court of uh, the European Court of Justice uh, was also a reaction to um, pushbacks in the Mediterranean so that then uh, the legal link was broken between Italy and Libya if we just delegate these policies and not um, carry out by EU. 
um, officials and the European Court of Justice has, of course, no jurisprudence on Libya then anymore. And, and then when we are there, the EU European legal system is, is blocked, cannot do anything to, 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 to uh, reestablish accountability. Um, so is there international law that can help out? And we see that some cases, some litigants go to the uh, Office of the High Commissioner of Human Rights. We see more discussions of refoulement uh, and, and inhuman treatment in the um, cuts. This is the uh, International Convention Against Torture and also in the Law of the Seas uh, Convention, which says that vessels shall help uh, persons in distress. Um, so we see uh, the mobilization of new types of law, which are not strictly refugee law to try to rescue <laughs> the, the normative environment, if you so want, uh, but, but it's basically being hollowed out by these practices. And, uh, and now Ukraine, does it, that, can it be a game changer? Um, so on, on the face of it, um, Europe's response is, is very generous with this temporary protection directive, which gives immediate rights to resident, uh, information, housing, welfare, medical care, family reunification, right to, to work immediately. Also, um, the freedom of movement was granted immediately. Um, there would be a provision restricting it, but um, in this case, it was not applied. I would say, after all, it's not so such a generous move because it's not asylum and it's, uh, the temporary protection directive is a discretionary instrument. Yes. It helps, but but it's it's a political decision. It's not a human rights basis as such. It has to be activated by a political decision, which is by it has to be initiated by the member states. They have to make the request to apply the temporary protection directive. Then the Commission has to agree, and then in the third step, there is a council vote by qualified majority on activating this directive. And in this vote, the content, the exact content uh, and the temporal scope um, is, is defined. So for now it's for 12 months. Uh, and it's for persons who have left Ukraine after 24th of February only for the time being. So what will happen in a year, right? Will it be, it will be again a political decision. Um, it's not asylum, it's not the same. Um, and I also think it's, it's not, uh, you cannot generalize very well because um, the visa requirement had already been lifted for Ukrainians with geometric passports in 2017. So that's not, not the same as for other uh, refugees. And it has also been the most um, numerous immigrant group in the EU in recent years, you see here um, in, in this graph. So, um, it's, it's a special case, and and more uh, moreover, I would say, um, firstly, it is a discretionary instrument, so it's not um, not uh, a, um, a safeguarding or a new um, emphasis on the uh, protective um, parts of the aki. It, it, it's it also an an exception to the normal asylum acquis, right? Um, and, uh, and secondly, the motives are humanitarian, yes, but also geopolitical. It's part of the West's response to the war and it, it's, it's an instrument yeah, in, in the war. Um, and, and the securitization uh, that we see for, for Ukraine, that, that the admission of refugees is part of, of our way to support Ukraine in the war um, is also seen in, in another uh, respect. And here I come back to this um, instrumentalization regulation that has been proposed and uh, invite you to, to read this. So this is in the context of what happened in Belarus uh, and, and the pressure Belarus put on, on the EU. Um, and uh, in, in this uh, proposal for a regulation, the commission defines the term instrumentalization of migrants. So it refers to a situation where a third country instigates irregulatory flows into the EU. 
um, actively. And so leading to a situation which can destabilize the union or a member state where the nature of such actions is liable to put a risk uh, at risk essential state functions, including its territorial integrity, the maintenance of law and order, and the safeguard of its national security. So this is quite a new step in the securitization uh, spiral. We recognize it's not adopted yet, but it would mean that we recognize that um, migrants can be a weapon. And, um, and this, in turn, then legalizes uh, the, um, the hollowing out of the protective acquis, because what you then read in the uh, instrumentalization regulation proposal is that all the provisions yeah, are not, not um, uh, mandatory anymore that would guarantee the human rights to be protected. Um, so to conclude, um, the official reform proposals at, of the Commission um, mainly um, produce more muddling through. They tackle the um, strategic environment only, the, the interests, conflicts of interest between the member states. But we have uh, more fundamental transformations at the normative level, in the normative environment, in the understanding of the rule of law, the interpretation of international norms the exercise of sovereignty and human rights protection. So we have a weakening of the normative ambition and we have an approximation of the protective to the protectionist acquis. Um, and Ukraine is not a game changer, but I would say it rather enhances the trend towards a more political, more discretionary, uh, less universalist approach to migration like, or to protection. That's it. <laughs> What I was hoping for. <laughs> Are there any questions? Observations? All the students who are working on project related projects. In that case, I gave the students the chance. Yes. Um, I, I want to uh, take you off on Ukraine as a game changer. Because uh, reflecting back to 2015 and the reallocation, and, and it was the Visegrad states that said, no, mm -hmm, yes. we won't play. Mm -hmm. And they, and again, their votes were necessary to make this uh, work. Well, what about now, particularly with Poland? Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned uh, Hungary was perhaps the most effective, but on the other hand, as long as as the Hungarians put it, Germany was violating the Dublin Convention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They were violating the norms, EU norms. Mm -hmm. um, it didn't matter because it was a matter of pass through, right? So practically, they were not uh, having large numbers stay there. Yeah. It's a different situation in Poland, right? Mm -hmm. And like you said, what happens in a year from now? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, it's, there's, a, there's optimism that the war or much of this is designed with this responsive design with the notion that this will not last that long. But that's optimistic. Hmm. Yes. I, I, so what I, happens in a yeah. year from now? Is Ukraine still not yeah, yeah. a game changer? Yeah, the, the question could be, uh, do, do these um, countries uh, develop an interest in, in relocation yeah. and, and then accept a, a binding relocation scheme? Uh, I think if 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 it happens, it can happen, but it will remain exceptional for the Ukrainians, and I cannot imagine um, a general relocation scheme to be accepted uh, by, by by these countries. Um, so I, I yeah. So it would be Ukrainians only. Yeah, this is my 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 hypothesis, but of course it's it's just a, a guess, right? Yeah. So, yeah. I think they, the, the EU has really moved away from this idea of mandatory relocations because there was too much of a contestation. And, and yeah, many questions arising about the possibility for the person to choose as also. But, it, but, but if Poland becomes Greece, 
mm. essentially, as a frontline state. Mm. Don't interest more aligned more. Yeah. Another another Eastern European state. Yeah, yeah. yeah no, I, I, I know it's 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 a possibility, but that uh, I I I would say this will even if it happens, it would not change the other trend that we see, which is the watering down of the standards of protection. Um, I would say also the temporary directive, uh, protection directive is 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 somewhat uh, watering down because it does not give as as good uh, stable prospects uh, and and uh, protection that the asylum status. So even if if there is a relocation solution adopted for Ukrainians, I would say it will not be generalized to, to, to refugees generally, and uh, it will not stop uh, the trend towards uh, yeah, less ambitious asylum system. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So I'm actually, this is really helpful for me because I'm writing my thesis on kind of what you just touched on, which is I'm using Green Hill's idea of course energy migration from opens of mass migration to see how it exposes your idea of organized democracy mm -hmm. in the EU asylum system. So one of my kind of policy proposals at the end of Professor Juvenic is my advisor as well, but um, mm -hmm. It's, I was the idea of making uh, like the weaponization of migrants illegal under international law, and I didn't realize that there already was an instrumentalism law in place. Could you just it's not in place, it's a proposal, oh, it's a proposal. Yeah, from December 2021. So it was, I'm just, I had never heard of it. So could you explain it a bit more to me if you don't mind? Yes. <laughs> um, so it is, uh, how, I, who, who would trigger it? I think it would be um, the. I, I would have to check, but um, so um, in in these situations that that you saw in the quote, um, uh, 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 like a state of emergency is is being applied, uh, which um, allows the country in question to um, have uh, well, basically to close the borders, uh, not to. Um, apply safeguards that are in the um, procedures directive um, to um, also um, extend uh, detention without um, basically without limits. Um, the provisions on vulnerable groups are um, are um, discarded. Um, yeah. So it's more of like a derogation of human rights standards than it is like trying to prevent or criminalize the actual action of weaponizing migrants? Uh, it's, it's like a state of emergency that a country can introduce when it can make the case that there is this um, threat uh, of, 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 of influx that would destabilize it. Um, and this allows the country to derogate from uh, the protective elements of the asylum aki, yes. So it brings it more into like kind of lessens the organized democracy by lowering the normative standards. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was legitimized with the Polish Republic. Did a Right. Yes. Yes. I have another thought. Um, if we agree that the, the, the main problems, the main issues with the common European asylum system were the Dublin regulation which of course fixes people in certain locations. And the other is the lack of solidarity mm. between member states. Might this not give an opening because the Poles who were refusing to show solidarity, the Hungarians who refused to show solidarity, have now an argument. We can say that we're not showing solidarity. We are showing solidarity, lots of it. And might this not create a new political dynamic? Yeah, I think. Many countries do not uh, participate so actively uh, in the debates, uh, are not so manifest, which, you know, live quite well with the status quo. 
if, if you look at these statistics, uh, I think even if, if these two or three Visegrad countries change position, this would probably not yet uh, change the balance. Mm. Get another idea. <laughs> if, to, 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 if, because what happens now, the general protection directive is these Ukrainians are free to move. They can go anywhere they want within the Union yeah, and, yeah. and find, find a job and send the kids to school and whatnot. Um, if this becomes a, a success, which is imaginable, yeah. uh, then maybe this may be. The, the, the bomb on the Dublin idea that someone who is an asylum seeker or a recognized refugee mm. needs to stay put. Mm. This was the first five years. Yeah. Um, so but if Ukraine show that it's complete mm. nonsense, it's not from counterproductive. Yeah. Uh, maybe I have to put CP in argument. To, to yes, yes I, I, I'm afraid I'm a bit a pessimist because I, I, I think, um, you know, the Geneva Convention initially had a geographical limitation also. I don't know if I mentioned it. Uh, so not only uh, does it have the statist privilege, but also it said that um, the refugee status was uh, reserved to persons who had moved uh, due to um, events that had, had happened in Europe. So, so it was limited to Europe. It was not a universal convention. It's only in 1967 that it was generalized. And I think what, what is happening with, with Ukraine is, is a European privilege. And it, it, I don't think it will be generalized again. I mean, the, the Temporary Protection Directive was also uh, designed in the context of a European war, the, the, the Yugoslav wars, and um, was not activated by the time, but when, when Syria war, you know, uh, was, was really pressing and it you could say it still is, but um, there was no interest in activating this, uh, although all the reasons would have been on the table. So the difference is, I think, uh, this European um, constellation that introduces a geopolitical motive and, and the Geneva a convention, the refugee regime, the international refugee regime for the, during the Cold War was al always very much supported by, by this ideological component and the Cold War component. And it's uh, after the end of the Cold War that we entered this phase of <laughs> the liberal international order aspiration. And we thought it, it's, it's a humanitarian instrument only, but it, it, it's not, I think it has never been, it has not been, we thought it would be, but it was probably, you know, wishful thinking by lawyers and, and so on. Um, now the political element comes in more again, and, and perhaps we will have, you know, more, more regional asylum system in the future. I believe there are questions or comments in cyberspace, is that right? No. No. Oh. It's me telling them that they can. Uh, oh. <laughs> they can pose their questions. <laughs> I have a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that um, asylum and migration is very much fixated on uh, on politics now. That there, this is basically one thing that should be detached from each other because it's. A little bit different, but then again, in the Geneva Convention, it's more or less state centered, so there's quite a political component to it. Do you think there's a way that we can um, differentiate those two parts again? Because right now, it feels like this is a highly political decision. Um, and first of all, can we do that? And secondly, do we want to do that? Okay, can, can you maybe bring an example or so? Because I and you said earlier that um, politics and the, the asylum is very uh, asylum is very much politics now, mm -hmm. and that this has been different. Uh, this has been a little bit different earlier. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was there's, there's, it's not black and white, but uh, the the legal development has been towards uh, uh, more human rights 
uh, instrument than a state political instrument. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. So, uh, thank you. This was really informative in many ways. But I, I, I kind of wonder a little bit. Um, you know, you talk about this kind of coping mechanism between a normative and a, a kind of with it when the contention between a certain normative framework and practical exigencies arrive. And I wonder, but is it, does the normative framework really matter? Because I feel like mm -hmm. so much of what you describe is tensions between supranational interests and state interests or uh, sovereignty interests. So, for instance, tensions between the EU being able to decide certain things versus states being able to decide certain things. That seems to be where we've ended up, yeah. or where the presentation ends up. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, the normative stuff we start with, the kind of commitment to human rights principles and the idea that this is a kind of uh, those I mean, other than being there on Frontex's, you know, I mean, Frontex was very much, I mean, isn't it working as intended in some sense? Isn't the point of Frontex precisely to be able to externalize the borders and so on? I'm just wondering whether calling them normative principles is giving them too much credit and we should, whether we shouldn't just call them ideology or some kind of, you know, I mean, I'm just wondering because it feels like at the end we actually get to different self interests. One is at the supranational state and one is at the kind of local, uh, local sovereignty. I'm not sure why or if the norms matter as much. And I was wondering if you had more to say about where the kind of norms really stand as a real factor in, in terms of the kind of the way that this will develop yeah. or has developed, if yeah. that makes sense. Well, I, I, I think the best sign that the norms matter is, is, is that we call this a crisis for the whole of the EU and that, you know, nobody's happy with, with this situation and it's really shaking up uh, yeah, it's it's shaking up the the uh, the the face or the confidence we have in um, in our capacity to deal with with um, the phenomenon or the challenge we could say. Yeah? If if it was not a normative conflict, nobody would care, and we would not call it a crisis. <laughs> Isn't the European Union conflict a crisis? Isn't it a crisis of whether you know whether you or not? Yes, I, I mean it's easy for the member states to to hide in in this because um, Frontex, I mean Frontex is really the the bad cop, right? Uh, and 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 the Commission and and mem some member states uh, do as if they were the good cop, but uh, Frontex, yeah, they, they ask Frontex to do what it does and let Jerry had to go, but the next one will not have a very easy, more easy job. Um, and this is part of the game, I would say this is part of this hypocrisy. And, uh, but, but it's real, there's, there's not the normative tension, otherwise it would not be so, yeah, difficult. <laughs> and maybe the EU is changing as well in, in the context of this um, geopoliticization. Maybe the EU is becoming more security actor and less of a normative actor. It's also a way to, to reduce the hypocrisy. Then we enter your perspective. Yes. I just wanted to kind of continue where Dr. Bloom began because I think this kind of pragmatism maybe that there is with Ukraine that okay it, it actually is more pragmatic to be able to, be able to move around recognizing how good it's a little bit of it we see very much in this kind of Europeans in different contexts and just this seems at least to me it's really depressing and I'm hearing this very kind of downward trend of protection and it's just getting worse so I'm just curious do you see any uh is there at all any signs of within the EU that you can see of this kind of accepting any kind of pragmatic notions, if you remember, which has like an existing reality that like the EU is kind of fighting to stop, but that it cannot effectively contain in the way that it's trying to. I'm just curious because that's kind of what, what one would logically think given when when you look at the situation, but somehow it just doesn't seem to make it itself its way through, uh, into the policy because it is so much about this kind of Mm. Sovereignty and yeah. securitization, etc. Yeah, I think it, it's good that you bring this up because um, th there's a lot going on at the same time. Um, so uh, I, I think what we are observing is, is more migration policies becoming more selective, and um, 
you know, states keep opening up borders uh, for wanted migrants, for highly skilled, for, you know, people um, in, in trade in services. This is something I'm working on. You have mobility clauses in trade agreements that, that have proliferated. Um, and, and demographics will also play a role. Um, the, the difficulties to, to have this picture of the state or the EU or whatever, who is able to choose <laughs> the migrants who come in. And as long as, as there is this ambition to be able to select, I think we will see these adverse or these repressive um, moves, even if at the same time we have openings in another dimension. Um, it, it's, a, it's a very statist reflex and, and we are entering a world which is more statist again, I, I, I think. Um. We were in a project funded by Horizon 2020 a couple of years ago where we looked at the failings of the cold European asylum system. And since this has been my thing. Uh, but one of the solutions we came up with after speaking with all kinds of stakeholders of the European Union is that maybe there's room or there ought to be more room for the local level. Uh, yes. There are many cities, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, mm -hmm. cities, uh, mm -hmm. who say, we want to mm -hmm. give mm -hmm. us money and we take a bigger role. Mm -hmm. Um, and that would then bypass more than the, the, the national level where right? populists are to bring. Um, what, do you think any any? <laughs> Um, uh, this is fascinating, and I uh, I always thought this is something I would like to look at. Uh, um, I, I think it's fascinating this um, emergence of a different level of governance um, at the local level, but also with the civil society implications and and the global compacts. You know, they they want to mobilize these uh, other levels to <laughs> to a bit circumvent uh, also or to to add to to the to the uh, rather um, status quo oriented uh, st state, nation state level. Um, yes, definitely it, this is also happening. This is what I'm telling my students when I teach a, a bachelor class on international cooperation. And, uh, and, and, and I say, yes, if, if, if you look at the states, you, you have the impression we go back to realism or neorealism, but if, if you look, we have had another transformation. We have transnational uh, ties, we have uh, social society actors, we have, um, we have cities um, also in networks and, and we have new communication means. Um, and this is, I think, um, a reality that has to be brought in. I think my story is more about the state perspective. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, just thinking about that, uh, uh, a lot of the cities to play a bigger role, this could be paired with a greater use of temporary protection as a modality, right? So allow people to move where there is demand for their labor. And in fact, that's also part of the thinking of the Nansen initiative, right? So to allow greater mobility, to allow uh, asylum seekers and refugees to work where they're wanted in a way. Mm -hmm. um, but isn't there also a problem with that coming, I mean, from uh, the refugee rights activist community and UNHCR because they're really afraid of opening up mm -hmm. and, and then there's a fear of temporary protection status in this way of becoming a, a, a substitute mm -hmm. for asylum. Mm -hmm. Is that, is that another tension? It's not just the yeah, I think so. tension. Yes, it's I, also yes. that there's a, a community of refugee activists that are also concerned about temporary protection. Yes. Yes, I, and I, this speaks a bit to, to uh, another <laughs> tension that I have come across when working on these things, is that more legalization does not necessarily mean more protection uh, by, by legalizing something by, by, by you know having precise norms uh, and, and enforcement mechanisms and all of this 
you, you also exclude many aspects that are not covered. So typically with, with the refugee definition, you, you impose borders on who deserves and who does not deserve protection that are very problematic. Whereas when you have a more flexible, uh, more pragmatic, as you said, approach, um, you can trust that if you have a good uh, opinion about humankind that, that it, it, it can work well, right? Um, and, and also it, with, with, with um, the relocation, uh, Florian Trauner uh, works a lot on this, uh, you may know him, and uh, he, we were talking lately and um, he said actually in an interview, a Maltese border guard um, told him the informal arrangements that they find sometimes with you know some other member states who informally take some people in. So they, there are these deals you know below the radar that in some vulnerable cases people are being transferred, uh, but on a voluntary basis informally. That 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 the, he, he, this border guard from Malta thought it was quite helpful. This level of you know practical pragmatic cooperation and that he was very skeptical about the commission proposals that would bring in such a level of complexity and, and regulation that has more adverse effects. So, and, and also when you look at other world regions that don't have so elaborated uh, legal system, sometimes, you know, people leave on one side with less, less entitlements, but on the other side, perhaps, uh, can integrate more easily, uh, so <laughs> it's 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 a complex. But I think our our systems here are more based on the law uh, as an organizing system. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, so a lot of it sounded very pessimistic. And I want to add some more pessimism. <laughs> um, I wonder, and this comes very much from, from my work, which is on uh, state theory. I wonder if this really in the end comes down to this is just what states do, what the modern state is about. The modern state excludes and controls. And um, I'm not sure if there's really any kind of salvation on the horizon beyond the kind of muddling through and legal compromise that we can find unless we decide that the way that states work in general is not what works anymore right and we need a fundamental transformation of the state into you know some kind of you know either federalization of the european union where you have an authority and you know where actual an actual parliament or an actual political majority can mm -hmm. uh, change the um the idea of relocation uh, or on the other hand, you have kind of a transformation of the European project into a smaller project where, uh, you know, countries like Hungary are being excluded. Um, and I'm not, you know, I'm just I'm not saying this is something that I wish to happen, but I wonder if, you know, in the end, that's all that's left kind of as a solution. Um, it, it doesn't seem to me that even if, you know, the hearts and minds of, uh, you know, 60% of, uh, voters that participate in the European elections is changed to uh, vote for parties that advocate for um, a very generous uh, asylum system that, that, that really matters in the mm. situation that we have, in the structure that we have mm. in the European Union. Mm. Yeah, well, I think that muddling through is maybe, you know, not, not so bad after all, because mm. you still have both sides and, and this is as much as we can get. Uh, and, and there's a bit on the margins, you know, things that can be improved, but but the real solution, mm -hmm. at least the one that, that I, I, I see some indication for that, that the protectionist uh, uh, approach is, 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 is taking, you know, more, more emphasis over the protective one. Uh, this is not, not what many of us would like to, so um probably we, we, we have to accept that uh, to, to, to live in this constellation and uh, and try to do little things that, that help and yeah, find you know informal ways to uh, to 
help. And, and, and I think this has always happened. I, I, I think it has never been, and also at the national level, asylum policy has always been hypocritical in this sense. But what, what I, I think in the EU is, is it is exacerbated because of this supranational pressure on the state. And, uh, or, I mean, pressure, uh, the states on the one hand wants to have a, a larger unit, but, uh, but when it comes to these uh, core state powers, it, it, it really reaches its limits. So I, I, I'm, I'm more skeptical about the EU developing uh, this ambition. I think maybe if, if we had a pure state system, some, some of these very adverse effects and some of this power that comes in because of the larger unit would not be there. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and maybe it's the, uh, the European Union that constrains certain state actions. And I'm thinking about the United Kingdom here. Oh, absolutely. Right? So, uh, and the United historically had a very restrictionist policy, et cetera, but now let loose. Uh, no. Okay. Plain eyes to Rwanda. I mean, what next for uh, other EU member states if they were to let free, you know, deportation of Madagascar? Uh, so you mean the EU context puts puts limits on it what states would do? Constrain some of the worst mm, impulses also, of some yeah. states. But then, like, is Rwanda really such a break from what we see with the externalization? Like, I don't know. It just to me it seems like it's kind of maybe a bigger step ahead, but it's kind of still in the same. Yeah. Trajectory, so I don't know. I think it's kind of part of the old game, just maybe with more spectacle. But I don't know, I'm not an expert on this. Doesn't seem like it's great to the UK policy. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. But I think maybe we will have more differentiated cooperation uh, in these fields, so more differentiated integration, you know, some states doing some programs together, and it is not. But I think this is also an interesting point when we look at kind of back to the Ukraine game changer question, right? The UK is not part of this game, not really game changer, but it's not part of this change at all, right? Yep. So they're also, one could argue that at least there is this kind of uh, tentative protection that just doesn't exist in the UK, right? The UK doesn't even uh, have the, you know, it didn't even drop the visa requirements for, for Ukrainian uh, refugees and yeah, so so also there, I wonder whether that's. And as I understand it, if Ukrainians cross the channel on a boat, they're also subject to, oh, mm -hmm. yeah, to being shipped to <laughs> Rwanda. Well, <laughs> on that note, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because what saying, note, yes. on that note, I think we can finish uh, and, and, and join in thinking. Sandra, once more, what is very illuminating. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the occasion to, to think further about this topic. <laughs> yeah. Would have to have better news. <laughs>